Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Wassalatu wassalam ala sayyidil anbiya wa muslim Wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in Ridwan Allah ta'ala alihim ajma'in Amma ba'd Alhamdulillah Praise and thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala For allowing us that we Can continue With another reminder from the ahadith of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah, the 40 hadith and compilation of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah. And alhamdulillah, we are coming with the, our third hadith, our third week of remainder. And today we'll be doing a hadith which is no stranger to many of our ears. And also, if we were to look into the hadith, it is somewhat part of which was discussed in the previous, in the last week. Hadith which we refer to Hadith Jibra'il and the Hadith goes narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar uh, narrated by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu he said I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying bunya al-islam wa ala khams shahadati an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammad rasulullah that Islam was built on five pillars and five structures the first of which is testifying that there is none worthy of worship but Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. Second, iqam is salah, establishment of salah. Third, wa ita is zakah and to give zakah, to fulfill the duty of zakah. Fourth, wa hajj al bayt, to perform pilgrimage to make hajj towards the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And last, wa sami ramadan and fast in the month of Ramadan. Aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. And this hadith is also recorded in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim rahimahumullah ta'ala. So we see from this hadith, it is part of the connection that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa answered a question which was posed by Jibreel alayhi salam. When Jibreel alayhi salam asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that mal Islam, what is Islam? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered regarding to the five pillars. So in reality, are in visual and listening when we look at the hadith we see as if it is similar the scholars have looked and, and to try and get an answer why Imam Nawawi rahimahullah he brought this hadith as uh, even though it is as similar which is mentioned in the previous hadith so they agreed that the reason Imam Nawawi rahimahullah brought this hadith after the previous one is to show the importance of the five pillars of Islam because this hadith stresses stresses the fundamental aspects of the outward submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we've mentioned last week, that Islam is about doing physical action submiss submissively towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submitting ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam Nawawi rahimahullah brought this hadith also to emphasize the aspect that we have in submitting ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outwardly with our action. And <clears throat> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned of this hadith that it is, Islam is built upon these five pillars. So submissive to, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based on some pillars similar to that like a structure, a house, that whenever we build a house eh, and we have foundations, we have pillars that is supporting of one another, that is support of the building. And when I, any one of those, whenever any one of those pillars it deems weak or there is a crack in any one of it or it is not constructed very strongly then it will cause a deficiency in the whole foundation in the whole house in the whole building and similarly it is that the aspect that when our submission our submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our pillars of outdoor action to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the pillars of Islam is being weak due to our negligence in performing acts and performing the pillars and upkeeping it then also it can render our deen very weak and this is only the outward action other aspects of islam which are not mentioned in this hadith it can be taken as a fine touches to complete and to beautify our structure just as when we do a house when we're making a house we finish the structure sometimes we paint it if there is cement we plaster over it to make it smooth and those are the fine touches that we make to beautify it similarly is that aspect so islam the pillars of islam is there and we have to strengthen that and then the other aspect which is not mentioned in this hadith is also part of purifying our islam 
to purify our deen, purify our submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we can see in this hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned, he compared and he used a metaphor in regards to the pillars of Islam. And in Islam, in the Quran, in the hadith, this is something which we see constantly, which is something, this is something which is used in numerous occasions because this is the beauty of when Allah mentioned the Quranic ayat when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed people and when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa speak to the people and the metaphor here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa use is when he says Islam is built upon five pillars Bunyal Islam ala khams Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used a metaphor as that of the image of a building, the structure of a building for us to visualize and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam many times whenever he will speak he will always use a metaphor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in the Quran in many places in for example one of the places Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he mentioned of the rewards a person give a person will get when he give sadaqah when he spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Baqarah مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ أَنْبَتَتْ سَبْعَ سَنَابِلَ فِي كُلِّ سُمْبُلَةٍ مِيَةُ حَبَّةٍ That a person, the example, the like of one who spends in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like that of a person who plants a seed and with one seed and with one of that wheat it sprouts 700. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used a metaphor to show us the reward a person gets when spending in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so those metaphors are used for us to visualize, for us to comprehend, for us to understand in a simpler way our mind can reflect and our mind can comprehend. Like companions radiallahu anhum ajma'een, the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will use metaphors for the companions and sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een to visualize Jannah, to visualize Jahannam. One of the sahaba said, he mentioned to his companions that he had already seen Jannah and Jahannam. So those that was around him, they were astonished, they were amazed. How can you see Jannah? How can you see Jahannam? And that is only possible after a person passed away from this world. On the day of judgment, a person will be able to see those things. So he replied, I saw them through the eyes of Rasulullah wasallam. Whenever Rasulullah wasallam will explain and whenever Rasulullah wasallam will admonish us, I saw Jannah and Jahannam through the eyes of Rasulullah wasallam. He said, he continued to say, I will not trust my own eyes, but I trust the eyes of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by his way of visualizing and using the metaphor. These modes of expression, these metaphors, which is used in the Quran and Hadith, should very well be understood because it is using things, it is using those uh, simplified examples, which is something which we can see in our day-to-day -day basis. For example, like I've mentioned, regards to the pillars of Islam and I've used the com I've mentioned of the comparison with a house because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even in the Hadith used a comparison of a house and those structure and physical structure we see in front of our life we see it in front of our eyes it is there we experience it daily that we understand that you know without a foundation without a pillar the house will not have proper support so those metaphors those methods of speech that is there we should use it and we be able to we use it to express understand to make ourselves our mind understand and comprehend that we can very well understood the meaning and understand the meaning which is well intended and similarly whenever we have to convey the message of islam it is also a lesson for us that whenever as da'i or as inviters towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards the message of al-islam we also utilize that aspect we also be able to utilize different methods of speech which will be simple and which can be understood according to the people or according to the time which we are speaking in. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Quran, ila sabili rabbika bil wal al hasana, that you call towards the invite towards the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using wisdom, using intellect and you use good advice. So in using wisdom and using your intellect that will also help and that will also include and utilize a metaphor and utilize in phases phrases which is acceptable or which is understood by those people the people that you're speaking to as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the hadith kallimun nas qad that you speak to the people according to their understanding according to their aql and what their mind will be able to comprehend so now let's look into the hadith 
the five pillars Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned. The first pillar, which is understood and which is no nothing new to any one of us, to any of our Muslims, is that of shahada, that of the testimony, accepting Allah subhanahu wa taala as your Rabb and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a messenger of Allah. So shahada, we can understand that it is made up or comprised of two parts. The first part of shahada is to testify that there is none worthy of worship but Allah, and you do not accept anyone, you do not believe anyone, and you not put any, and you do not put anyone in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And for this, there are seven conditions of shahada. In the first part, there are seven conditions. One is that knowledge, that of knowledge to understand what it means, to understand what testifying to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala means. Second is certainty. To have yakin, conviction, you know, have no doubt about anything from Quran and Sunnah. Third is acceptance. By the tongue, you just don't say it merely by the tongue, but you accept it even with the tongue, and you accept it from deep within yourself, with from your heart. Fourth is that of submission, to comply, to submit yourself towards Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, accepting whatever Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, what Quran and Sunnah say. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you submit yourself as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu urkhulu fi silmi kafa. This address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give to anyone. Did not give to a random and say, Ya ayyuhal nas, all mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not address to any disbeliever or the kuffar or any specific religion. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically uses towards the believers. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu. All those who believe, enter wholeheartedly enter submissively into Islam submit yourself solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without a doubt so it's very important an aspect of our shahada fifth is that of truthfulness sidq that whenever we say shahada whenever we say shahada sincerely we recite it truthfully we recite it with honestly without having any doubt without even just reading it because someone is forcing us or someone is watching us but we read it and we actually mean it so actually there is two parts truthfulness and sincerity both goes hand in hand that we do see we do it solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and last is that to love we have love for shahada we have love for its implication we have love for its requirements and whatever law it stands by and with this it all comes down it all boils down to one point that shahada is not just merely seeing it with our tongue seeing it with our tongue but it's acknowledging it with our heart with our physical limbs we show it that many a times you know we say we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but how much we show that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is one thing as mankind we tend to forget that if we say something with our tongue and but it is in our heart we will show the, uh, the action outwardly similarly submitting our submitting ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to do with the five pillars of Islam if we were to say we love Allah if we were to say we believe in Allah but we're not following any of the pillars of Islam how can that say that you know how can we say or how can an individual say that look alhamdulillah I've said it is in my heart Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in my heart but physically outwardly you're not submitting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're not fulfilling the pillars of Islam then it does not go hand in hand. Seeing with your tongue and being in your heart, it will automatically show outwardly in our body and our action. And the second part of the shahada is that of acknowledging, testifying, and believing in Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, accepting Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the messenger of Allah. And this comes in believing Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in whatever he told us, in whatever he conveyed to us, and we obey him in whatever he commanded us to do and we we stop from whatever he prohibited us from doing and we try to emulate and follow him in whatever way in his footsteps whatever way we can follow him and to understand and practice the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that took us the, that is basically a summary from the first part of the hadith which is referring to the shahada the second part the second pillar is that of establishing salah that of prayer and we understand the qama salah Prayer being the first command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after Iman. That hadith mentioned that prayer in Islam is like that of a head on a body. Without the head on the body, there is no life. Similarly, without salah, 
there is no Islam of a person because it is that of a head and a body. It is needed. It goes hand in hand. That is why it is being the first command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only being the first command of Allah, it will also be the first command and the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question us on the day of judgment. And in order to fulfill this pillar, we, whenever we perform salah, we should also look at all the conditions of salah, the compulsory acts of salah, inwardly and outwardly. We should prepare ourselves properly for performing salah. Whenever we have to go to salah, we just don't rush to salah, but we go with a sort of cool and calm mind and contentment in our heart that when we perform in salah, we know we perform our salah as if it is our last salah, that if we will never have a chance to perform salah. And like we mentioned last week, that whenever we perform salah also, is as if Allah, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us and our action should only be done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We try to perform our salah, observing all the good manners and etiquettes of salah. Like I said, from preparing beforehand, outward of salah and from whenever we are in salah. That many a times we perform salah, we raise our hands in takbir, we say Allahu Akbar. But whenever we start our salah with Allahu Akbar, then as mankind, our minds start wandering different places. As a businessman, they start thinking, okay, how many profit I have made today? Or how many customers will I have? How many, how many hours will I open today? How much will I do I have to do this? Or how many goods do I have to order? And it's a sad reality because the fact that we've seen Allahu Akbar, if we comprehend from the meaning of seeing Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. When we raise our hand to see Allahu Akbar, in reality, we are supposed to be throwing everything away from this dunya, from this worldly life, from this worldly attraction, and we turn to, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, acknowledging the fact in our heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest, that we should not have our mind towards anything. The third pillar of, for that hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned is that of zakah. <clears throat> we know, we've heard, and alhamdulillah, many of us, many Muslims, with the capacity or with the capability of giving zakat, they fulfill the duty of zakat, especially in the month of Ramadan. Zakat has been pointed out by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa for certain things and in certain ways. And we giving zakat is our right and it is actually, it is the right of the mal, the money that we have upon us. It is not our right, it is actually the right of the money. That the money we've been given it is a trust, it is an amanat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to fulfill its right. And one of the right of those money is that we give the Jew zakat, we give the Jew charity which is incumbent upon us. And that is a means, like we know we're not going into depth of zakat, but we always, we have heard from different scholars and different lecturers and speakers that zakat means purification. And this aspect is a form of purifying our wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase us. So it is the right that the money has and the wealth has upon us that we should give our zakah. And this is also a very important aspect and a very important part of Islam. That is why it is considered a pillar of Islam and is a support of Islam. And if we were to miss this pillar or any other pillar also, it will render the structure imbalanced. It will render the structure weak that even a hard wind can remove and uplift the structure the fourth is that of hajj and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the quran walillahi ala nasi hajjul bayti man ilayhi sabila and for allah upon upon the people is that they perform hajj towards the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whoever has been given the capability whoever has that capacity whoever has the means and pilgrimage to the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an obligation that we only do once in our lifetime and this unconditional obviously as we meet those requirements there are certain requirements that we need to meet for example having the means and not just having the means to go financially but as well as we have the means to go we must be able to have the means to provide for our family that we left behind and we can have them for that amount of duration will be away we should have the means to support and provision to support our family that will be left behind so once those conditions are fulfilled and whatever other conditions are there which you can also get from your local or resident scholars or, or imam and so once those conditions are fulfilled only then does hajj becomes compulsory in a person and it's only compulsory once a lifetime once a lifetime so scholars have mentioned regards to this that if a person have means of performing hajj and he does not perform hajj 
and he passed away then obviously such a person passed away a sinner and it as, as if he forgo one of the pillars of Islam so that's why it as Muslims it is compulsory upon us as soon as we have the means as soon as we have that capacity and that financial ability we should not hesitate we should not put off doing Hajj because we do not know how long will we have our wealth or we will have our money because I've mentioned last week in our reminder is that the wealth that we have we can have it in the morning and by evening we go we become poor we become pauper or we go to sleep with wealth and we wake up in the morning we pauper we poor we fakir so we do not know how long the wealth we have will be with us and secondly is that of our health we do not know how long we'll be physically active and physically healthy and that physical capability will be with us so as we have the means and we have that physical capability we shall not put off doing our hajj and be held accountable for that and last the fifth pillar rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned in the hadith was some ramadan and to fast fasting in the month of ramadan we've all came out from the month of ramadan just now we've witnessed the month of ramadan alhamdulillah we've heard many reminders before the month of ramadan about ramadan and even during the month of ramadan we've heard reminders about ramadan that is why I am not going in details about all these, all of these pillars because we've heard about them or we hear about them at the appropriate time whenever the season is there, whenever the time of the, the season of that pillar is around us and we've heard so much about Ramadan and we know Ramadan, that month of Ramadan being a blessed month it is actually a sort of training program for all Muslims that we go through we purify ourselves, we purify our nafs, our desire, our body physically, our body mentally. We purify our organs. Every aspect is of training is found in the month of Ramadan whenever we fast. We perform so many good deeds spiritually with Tilawat of Quran, we're performing Salatul Tahaj, we're performing Salatul Taraweeh, and so many other optional Salah and Nawafi Salah we perform in the month of Ramadan. It helps us spiritually. And when in the month of Ramadan, we also make such personal commitments that we do certain extras, the extra tilawat, or we do certain extras askar, zikr, and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know many, many brothers and sisters in the month of Ramadan, they exert themselves much more in making dua, or they, they point out a specific amount of duas that they continue reciting daily. And this is all part of reforming ourselves during the month of Ramadan. And with these now, with these five pillars of Al-Islam and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, all of these is what is the foundation and is what is the basis of the structure of Islam and the structure of a Muslim life, that these five pillars is what our lives surround. And if these five pillars are weak, as I've mentioned at the beginning, then our Islam will become weak. All of these pillars they have their own ruling which I have not dwelled much into because that's different and that's a lengthy topic on its own for each individual pillars. So all of them have their own rule and all of them have its own conditions and its own adab and ahkam. So what is important if for us to learn about these pillars of Islam, we, we dive into the book and we have that zeal and enthusiasm, we look into the history, we look into the Quran and Sunnah regarding to what is mentioned and what ruling is there for these different pillars of Islam and we try to implement it in our life that we can keep up to date with Islam we can beautify our our structure, our pillars so we can beautify our structure of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that when we be able to practice the five basic pillars of Islam it will make it easy for us that we can be able to put in all the and make addition of all the other small points that we can smooth it off and we can beautify our life as a Muslim inwardly and outwardly. I pray and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give us understanding may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us so that we can practice and we can implement the five pillars of Islam with its conditions, its rulings easy in our life without any hesitation and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us that not only to the five pillars of Islam but every aspect of Islam that has to do with the believer from his Iman, his internally, his outward action, internal action, his spiritual action and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us that we can benefit from it all and we increase ourselves in his worship. 
جزاكم الله خير أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم جزاء وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته